Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Raya Salter. In our show this time, we'll cover our continuing adventures on the street, made possible with our Live View LU500 video transmitter. We'll take our LU500 and camcorder for walks around Honolulu, and we'll talk with the people we meet to see what they're thinking. So our show this week is about Think Tech on the street using our LU500 the remarkable technology that lets us talk to people and broadcast that live from anywhere in Hawaii. Live View is made by an Israeli company that has created a small footprint video transmission system that makes it possible to live stream video from pretty much anywhere. This changes the world of remote video and opens new doors for television broadcasting and for think tech too. Live View uses what they call bonding technology. It combines multiple cell phone modem signals into one really fast broadband connection and allows us to stream video signals so clear that it's as if we were back in the studio. Our LU500 is the size of a cigar box and can go anywhere. We became aware of this technology from news network videographers who have come to Hawaii and stream their signals live back to the East Coast. We have also seen it at the NAB show. That's the National Association of Broadcasters Conference in Las Vegas every spring. And we started to get an idea of just how good it is. With a grant from the Cook Foundation, we were fortunate enough to be able to acquire this equipment, including the remote transmitter and a studio server to receive the signal. And we have been using it for remote location shoots since the beginning of this year. The possibilities for remote video in Hawaii are limitless. We started with on-location shoots in the downtown area, including on the Fort Street Mall just outside our studio, Tamron Park at Bishop Square, the State Capitol, and City Hall. This technology is driving a video revolution, providing live feed for television, mobile, online, and social media, transmitting high-quality live video content from anywhere in the world. Remote live video offers promising possibilities for online news, events, sports, education, and more. The in-the-moment effect is a big boost for delivery of content to audiences everywhere. We are here um, outside Port Street Mall talking to folks about fake news. I mainly, you know, get my news out of real news sources, so I don't, I don't spend it. a lot of time getting fake news off of fair, social fair, media. Fair enough. Maybe I, that's I, a safe way. What I, are the sources that you prefer? Well, I watch about, you've got to watch four different TV channels to get any real news anymore. The real news used to be when Jay Fidel and I were around, you listen to Uncle, Uncle Walter Cronk, I tell you the news, and that, that was the damn news. Well, you see it a lot, especially via social media, um, with a lot of different things, because a lot of people, they'll go ahead and post stuff, like even in terms of like the, the elections, they were saying, oh, okay, well, there was a big turnout. There's, oh, well, you know, CNN said it wrong, or New York Times printed the wrong numbers, or the picture was fake, or falsified. And I think the, the issue is that people don't really do, you know, their research. But what about all those people from those seven countries that he banned? He banned. What about them? How do you feel about them? It's not fair. Like, especially if they are American citizens too. Just because they, like, if they dual citizenship, just because of the other country they come from, they're not allowed in. You know. Yeah. I think it's unfair too. Yeah. You, got, you guys, are you are you from the U.S.? No. Oh, where are you from? The U.K. Have you been banned yet? No. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> So let's talk about Europe for a minute. You know, there are a lot of issues in Europe, yeah. in Germany and France, and uh, for that matter, Belgium, and so on. But they're not, it's not in Scandinavia. Scandinavia doesn't have issues like that? Yeah, no. I think it's because of the strict politics, you know. Uh, when the Syria crisis, we didn't take that many uh, people in in our country. Personally, I don't think that was a good way to handle you it. I think they should have taken more uh, migrants. Yeah, I think. Germany took so many and we didn't take any compared to those, so... What are you studying? Environmental studies. Ah, what are you yeah. going to do with that? I have no idea. <laughs> I wanted to work in the federal government, but... <laughs> yeah, that may not be so easy anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's an open market, you know, you come out here, you get local produce, you got local fruits, you know, we pick it up, we bag it, and we bring it out here and, you know, it, and we distribute it to the people of the island. You know, and I feel that, you know, everything local is a lot better than buying stuff from the mainland. I do a classic uh, popcorn, which is uh, uh, cooked in sugar and then lightly salted. A caramel, where it's cooked the same exact way and then salted. Um, a rainbow, so five different colors, five different fruit flavors. Bike share will have, will have public bikes. Uh, there's going to be a thousand bikes in urban Honolulu, spread nice. out uh, across a hundred stations between basically here 
in Chinatown downtown to Waikiki. Uh, when you're riding your bike around, it's always good to see other people on bikes and to have a thousand more bikes on the street is going to be great. We're here talking to folks um, in the park about their plans for Valentine's Day. First, ladies, maybe you can tell me, are you single? I'm single. Oh, okay, <laughs> fellas, she's single. <laughs> she's married. Uh-oh. <laughs> Off the market. I think he's making a lot of big decisions that are influencing um, this country negatively. From my personal perspective, growing up in Europe, we always looked at the United States at the, as the land of freedom, the land where no matter what your background is or um, where you were from or the color of your skin, you could actually be someone if you worked hard. And I'm Marcia Joyner, and today we are at the Hawaii State Capitol, and we were here to hear the decision making about the bill medical aid and dying. Doctors deal with this issue all the time in hospitals. You know, they're controlling people's pain, but that control of pain often results in them dying. And uh, they call that a dual effect. But I mean, you know, the, you don't do this to patients without the, their consent, but they say, you tell them, look, we're going to help your pain, but if we control your pain, we give you enough medication to control your pain, you're likely to stop breathing. Well, we're hoping that the vote for the Senate will be favorable. It will pass by a strong majority vote. And then at that point, it crosses over to the House, and the House will get their opportunity to hear the bill and really see the amount of support that there is for medical aid in dying and ultimately pass it. At this point, I can say that the... uh the majority of the House, I think, I believe, feels favorably for the passage of that bill. Well, I think most people are focused on national politics. People are out, you know, really making their voices known on national politics, national issues. It's been kind of quiet over here. We hope that they, we're starting to see a pickup in activity, but hopefully they'll come out to their legislature and make their voices known. There's a lot of things we can do to add to their voice to the legislative process, even though it has to do with the federal government. I miss Sam. You know, Sam has a... Um self-deprecating humor, he has a oratory vo- voice, and he is kind of the bellwether of all the conservative issues in the state of Hawaii. So he, he's dearly missed, but we had him at the Beer Summit last week, and he was jovial and giving his sense of what the world should be like according to the Lone Ranger, and he's gonna do well. We're, we're, we're trying to get him a uh, Trump administration appointment. There's an ordinance existing now, uh, Ordinance 0701, and that means it's the first ordinance that will, that Uh, became an ordinance in the year 2007, specifically states that there are only two mechanisms of funding for rail construction. That's monies derived from the state general excise tax surcharge and monies derived from the federal government. So that means that there are no other funding sources that can be used for rail construction. That's rail construction. Well, what about operation? Operation and maintenance, we will need to utilize real property tax revenues as we do now for the operation of our existing uh, city public transportation system. This is all giving us a great opportunity to learn how to best use this technology and stream this content to our ThinkTech viewers. Here are some of our recent interviews on the street. We're here with John, and John, I'd like to ask you, what, uh, how are your feelings about supporting local agriculture here uh, and also local farmers? Well, I think it's really vital, the fact that uh, most of the food we eat comes from overseas. so. Finding the, the, the space and the people that can do, uh, that can produce um, what we need to eat is vital here and I think that means supporting the farmers as well. Well that's a good question because a lot of restaurants and a lot of food products within stores like Whole Foods and things like that, they specialize in local products. Do you go seek that? Do you support and seek uh, those specialized products? You know I do and I think, you know, There's definitely a taste difference as well. It obviously is fresher and such, but restaurants also, we make sure that, you know, we're not trying to order something that is not uh, normally available this time of year and see what the local uh, local produce for that particular season is. I don't have a particular opinion about the vehicle that's before the legislature now, but I think that people should have the right to choose to die if they meet a certain list of criteria, like if they have a terminal illness. I think it's about giving people that personal choice to decide how they end their life as opposed to just forcing people to live in chronic pain. I think that puts individuals in a tough position and also family members. If they were to ask them to pull the plug on them, but that's not legal, it just puts 
I think families who are grieving and in tough situations into gray legal waters. Oregon is one of the few states that have actually passed that, that bill, and, and it's been on the books for, I think, at least, four, uh, at least five or six years. Um, what do you think other states, um, I think they tried to put the bill out and try to get them passed, but with no success. I wonder what they were doing differently. I'm not really sure, but from what I've heard from the Oregon example, is that they haven't had any cases where they've been very concerned, like where it's been flagged as maybe there was some um, like ethical issues. I think a lot of the opponents of it like to talk about how people are going to be pushed towards killing themselves because family members or the state isn't interested in paying for their care going forward. But from what I understand of the Oregon bill, there are a lot of checks and balances, multiple doctors that have to approve. And I think if we were to do the same thing here and ensure that there are checks and balances and that no one gets forced into anything, then I think people deserve to have that right to decide the fate of their life. You had any thoughts about the Medicaid proposal being cut um, through the Trump administration? I think it's really just a shame that we've made the Affordable Care Act into Obamacare and politicized it because if you have people just look at the proposals that are in the bill, a lot of them support it, pre-existing conditions, staying on to your 26. And I even saw recently that like 40% of Republicans were interested in a single payer option for health care. I think people just generally want to be taken care of and know that at a very basic level they are going to be okay. And I think it's really indicative that we're moving towards a a societal consensus that health care is a universal right. Former police chief of Seattle uh, was uh, in the federal government, and I can't remember his exact role, but he came out very strongly for the uh, decriminalization of marijuana. Right. So do you draw a distinction between decriminalization versus um, medical usage, or do you see they're on the same plane? Well, I see there's a little difference. I mean, I'm actually for bold. Uh, I've been in law enforcement for 35 years, and I think the big thing that I uh, recognize as far as marijuana use is, is that I see when um, states have gone to that, that the hard narcotics, which is really destroying a lot of what the country and what's going on, I think that drops immensely when you uh, legalize marijuana. I think obviously you've got to have restrictions and control it. and. Um, you know, just like alcohol. So yeah, and I've always been for uh, medical marijuana. I, you know, I see people that are on medical marijuana, and instead of them having to be on prescription medications and different type of narcotics, that uh, seems like they have reverse effects. A lot of times, uh, medical marijuana makes them calmer, have a better, uh, healthier outlook for life. What do you think about the epidemic of? Um uh, Oxycontin overdoses and, and things of that nature. What, what do you think is the, the cause of that suddenly? Well, from the state that, that I'm from, Indiana, uh, we've definitely seen an increase in it. And uh, I think it's gotten cheaper. Uh, it is an extremely addictive uh, narcotic. I think um, medically a lot of people uh, it became uh, the prescription jug of choice through prescription legally and then it became abusive and people that uh, learn how to use abusive drugs by selling their drugs to, to uh, and it just taken off. I mean, our state right now, we're having an epidemic, our county, the city I'm from, we're having an epidemic to the extent that uh, <clears throat> we just went through training where all of our officers now carry Narcon, uh, which is a quick uh, remedy for uh, heroin overdoses that we're finding on the streets. And uh, it's so sad because uh, there's several people we've probably saved three or four times within the last month or two, and there's just a strong addiction to cheaper drug now, so that's what they're going to. And that's one reason I'm kind of in favor of legalizing marijuana, mm -hmm. is I think the states have done that. It's dramatic what, uh, how did, uh, the hard use of narcotics, prescription drugs, to uh, all the other, you know, heroin, crack cocaine, you do know, you meth, think, I think it's Do dropped. you think there's a leg legislative fix to this, or is it just going to have to come from societal, from the ground ground up? Well, I think you got to have legislation involved and have rules, like everything. Society has to have rules. The, 
to make things function because uh, even with rules, people always push the limits on that, which mm -hmm. usually creates problems and creates a bad image for that rule. So, yeah, I think you got to have legislation, and then the rule, you have to have rules, and it trickles down. Last question: Do you think your peers on the force share your your thoughts, or um, do you think uh, you're a minority in that thinking? No, I, I'm the I'm an old school cop. I've been on a long time, been seen all the changes. Uh, definitely, the younger officers coming on, I feel feel that way, and I, and I'm probably one of the last. Uh, old horses that have started looking that way and, and, and feeling that way and I felt that way for years and I, I think before I retire which will be in a couple years I think it will happen in our state it's it's going that way and, and uh, law enforcement is not really the roadblock for that. Steve I'd like to ask you about the Memorial Day weekend and usually it represents the beginning of summer but as you know it's a very solemn uh, holiday and do you think the holiday still has relevance? To some people it does. Um, to me, I remembered my dad. He was in the military, so uh, to me it does. I don't think people uh, have a, an appreciation for history like they used to. As a young, I, I taught in college for a number of years, and young people know nothing about the Second World War. They know nothing about Pearl Harbor. They don't know who Dwight Eisenhower was. They don't know who MacArthur was. It's really kind of sad. Seems like a lot of people are having picnics and you know doing all the things that summer represents, and you know that's a good thing, and that's, you know that's all right. But do you think that people are taking the time to really sit down with the meaning of the holiday and, and try to reflect on those that gave their lives for this country, and through whether it be the Revolutionary War, Civil War, all the other conflicts in between, uh, do you think people actually take the time to reflect that? Unfortunately, I think they don't. Um, these parties that you say and, and picnics. Um, they're just there to meet family and friends and they don't reflect on the past nowadays. Do you think it's time to change the holiday or, or, or try to give it a new significance and meaning somehow? I think give it a new significance and meaning. Uh, you see, this, we just came from Ross. It's full of people. It's, it took her almost 20 minutes to get through <laughs> the cashier. So, the older people maybe think more of the fallen heroes than some of the younger people because we've known a little more of the history. We're on the cruise ship and the first announcement I heard this morning was today is Memorial Day. It's a day of mourning for the lost heroes. Um, no, I think the past is the past and pretty much everybody's moved on. You think it's time to come up with a new holiday or keep the, keep the Memorial Day holiday in existence? Um, well, I worked, so it doesn't really matter <laughs> about a holiday or not. Right. Um, for a lot of people, it's just another day off for them. Have you seen or experienced road rage here on our, our, our roadways or highway? Unfortunately, yes. Um, I, I live out on the west side on, uh, of the island, and I drive um, back and forth daily. It's, it's, uh, it, can be, it can be challenging, particularly when you have um, drivers who are aggressive um, and other drivers who um, aren't polite and letting people in. Yeah, I definitely witness it. Um, I wouldn't say daily, but at least once a week or so on. Um, That's quite a bit, actually. Yeah, usually happens, you know, either early in the morning, you know, when everyone's rushing or usually after work time, you know, when it's uh, packed with traffic. What kind of things are you seeing? I mean, you see them directed at other people or have you ever been involved? with uh, some of these events? Well, of course, you know, if, you, if you drive long enough, you, you certainly are. And, and what I try to do is I try to just say, hey, you know, God bless you, you know, and, and just let them in and let's let them go ahead. I, my thing is I just don't want them to take me with them when, when, they, when they have a bad accident. Or, you know, I'm not gonna get into a, a, a beef with somebody you know, for, for driving. Uh, there, was one, there was one time when I was coming from Kaneohe and I was going over the H3 and this, uh, this guy was just really tail, tailgating me for, for, for some reason. Um, what I what I did was I, I held up my phone and and just and just showed him that I was, you know, calling calling the uh, calling the authorities and then he sped off and, and left. But um, if it was really bad, I just I would just call uh, 911 and and tell tell them where I am and what's going on and or, or the you know drive to the nearest police station. I've seen I've seen it all. I've seen people you know like cut other people off and then get out the truck or the car and start calling them out or swearing at them. Um, say people, you know, honking their horns, the usual swearing and stuff like that. I guess we all kind of have 
some type of road rage and we deal with it differently. Um, but yeah, usually when you see it, you see the, the higher end of it. What, do you th what would you guess is the number one thing that irritates people the most when they're on the road? Um, I'm guessing, well, mine personally is slow drivers, you know, really slow drivers and stuff like that. Um, Na nationwide, that ranks 13%, so you're part of the 13% nationwide. Okay, well, that's good. Um, yeah, I guess maybe another one would be, um, you know, when you cut somebody off or something, don't use, you know, your blinker or whatnot. That's probably a big one also. That is. That's number two. So uh, I'm going to give it to you. Uh, the number one reason people are irritated is they see people looking down at their phone while driving or at a stoplight. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would probably be one of mine's too. Yeah. If you were the direct recipient of someone's rage, what do you think you would do? Uh, do you know kind of the steps that you would want to think about before things escalated? Um, definitely think if I'm going to go to jail or not. Probably not do anything that would be that bad. But, um, you know, probably just try and mellow out the situation as best as you can. I'd like to know how you feel about how President Trump is doing so far in office since his election. I give him an F. I just don't think he's qualified. I think he has poor listening skills. I believe he projects his issues. So every time he points a finger and calls another country something else or somebody else something else, he's really talking about himself. He even said that he hasn't changed since he was two years old. So we're dealing with a two-year-old president. One segment at 12.40 and one at 1.40 p.m. on Tuesdays and Fridays. And we also use it in our breaks and overnight feed. We're also planning to expand our walkabouts to trips to other areas in Oahu and on the neighbor islands. As usual, we make our Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 movies on these trips, but we'll also stream some of our footage back to our studio for live broadcast. Want to see more of our On the Street segments? See our Think Tech On the Street playlist on YouTube.com. Want to know more about LiveU? Check out LiveU.info. Stay tuned for more. Not only our expanding array of talk shows and Think Tech Spectrum OC16 feature shows, but also our expanding array of on-the-street segments from remote locations. As they say, think tech better every day. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar and we don't hear much about them. But ThinkTech will take you there. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. To stay current on what's happening in government, industry, academia, and in communities around the islands and the world. ThinkTech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then, we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show, or if you want to replay or share our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. The audio is on thinktechhawaii.com radio. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. See our website for links. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links or sign up on our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. Think Tech has a high-tech, green screen, First Amendment studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to join our live audience or participate in our shows, write to think at thinktechhawaii.com. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives together in these islands. We want to stay in touch with you and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. 
Let's think together. You can call into our talk shows live. While you're watching any of our shows, you can call into 415 871 2474 and pose a question or make a comment. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Raya, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Raya does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the new technology that extends the reach of our media. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Raya Salter. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.